What was the greatest moment for you of your career? If I could replay one for you now, what would you choose? I don't know. Um, when I was 16, I went and fought this man in um, Boston, Massachusetts. He was, um, I was, I was 15, 16, he must have been 28. He beat me, but it was really close. I, I thought I had fought my best fight then. And that's the one you, that's the one you'd remember. Yeah. That's so fascinating. awesome. All right, another great episode of Hot Boxing is on its way. I'm Mike Tyson. I'm Evan Britton. And our guest here today is Pierce Morgan. How Hell you doing, yeah. Pierce? I'm very excited to be here, Mike. Yeah, I was talking to you earlier, Pierce. Um, where actually are you from? You're not actually from London, England, are you? No, I'm from the south. So right. it's just south of London, about an hour south on the south coast. Grew up, brought up in a little village. My parents ran a country pub. Yeah. So I grew up in an environment where most nights people were drinking too much, getting into fights, and my dad having to throw them into the street. So, you know, I had a bruising upbringing, but you think you had it tough. <laughs> you should have been in my village in those early years. I've been in England most of my life, right? But until they made that silly law, if you did more than three or some years, you can't come back in, something mm. to that effect. And every time I've been there, those guys, um, they're like legendary folkloids, you know? Mm. They, they remember the past, the tough bad men and everything, the real bare knuckle fighters. Mm. Now, we're a nation of warriors. It's just amazing. Absolutely. Most it's Brits are up for a scrap if yeah. you give them half a you chance. You guys fought Caesar, remember? Mm. Who? You fought Caesar. Who? You fought Julius Caesar, fought the remember? Yes. Yes, yeah. I do remember that, yeah. Yeah, but listen, Mike, in, I mean, in Britain, Mike is an absolute icon. Yeah. I mean, I remember you going down, I think it was the last time you came over. I remember, I think you went down to Brixton or somewhere. Was that crazy? And the cr it was, honestly, it That's was crazy. as if Mandela had gone down there. It was nuts. But I remember thinking that was a really, it was a really interesting thing to watch, to see someone like you down there and the crowds that came out. Very powerful. They, they was, loved you. To me, that was overwhelming to me at that time in my life. I bet. You know, I was just... When was that? I don't know. I was fighting then. I don't know what time it was. Oh, okay. But it was just crazy. Because we had a funny story. Because I was, I used to run a newspaper called the Daily Mirror, one of the big selling I papers. That paper. And when you fought Julius Francis, do you yes, remember that? Yes. that? Julius Francis was, he wasn't a great fighter, to be honest with you. But uh, Frank Warren had set up this fight with you and Julius Francis. So I rang Frank and I said, look, is there any sponsorship available on Julius Francis? Oh, yeah. So he, so he, he said, um, he said, well, what do you mean? What are you thinking? He said, I said, well, has anybody that. has anybody sponsored the seat of his pants and the soles of his feet? And his shoes. Soles of his shoes. So Frank goes, what are you, what are you getting at? I went, look, if we were to offer twenty thousand pounds, could we put the Daily Mirror logo on his backside and on the soles of his feet? Because I've got a feeling we're going to be seeing a lot of that on TV. And the funny thing was, it was airing on Sky Sports, which was Rupert Murdo, who were the rival newspaper group as well because they had the sun so julius francis gets in against mike and i'm watching it live at home thinking come on mike just knock him over at least four or five times with the with our logo he had a bunch right? of knockdowns and he, he, had a a bunch of knock so he knocked him over it's four or five times down. and each a time, bunch of knock each, downs, right? each time yeah. all each time all he saw were his feet like this with daily mirror or his back with Pierce. daily mirror on and we did i remember the front page i can remember it the whole front page was a picture of his over the feet like this, and it just said "Pride in Defeat." <laughs> you know, I have to say Dude, this. That's um, insane. <laughs> I you know I spent a lot of time in England. I've been oh man, I've been on like um, tours in England. I would go now. I would go from I would start from London, and we would go all the way up to York, mm. Duncaster, all the time Birmingham. We would just keep going derby just kept going we did just, you like it did you like i loved it you just on, on tour meeting it. people speaking Tours, um meeting greet having dinners um wow. two thousand three thousand people it's mm. just crazy fish That's and chips crazy. with mushy peas might you try um, that no oh yeah we have fish and chips fish and chips and mushy <laughs> yes, peas up north so what got you into the um show business well i always wanted to be a journalist so from an early age i just was obsessed with news and newspapers and then i i did it the conventional way i trained to be a journalist uh went on local papers for a couple of years in wimbledon in south london with the tennises wimbledon news was my first paper and then i worked my way up onto the national papers and then ended up becoming the youngest ever editor of a national daily newspaper well, that must have been a head trip for you it was a pretty you know it's a very interesting thing isn't it where the, where 
there's a fearlessness of youth. And I know that you must have felt that when you were, I remember watching you fight when you were 20, 21, and you were completely fearless. And that fearlessness as you get older, it becomes, you know, you lose a little bit of the fearlessness once you start having commitments and mortgages and, and kids and all the rest of it. I think there is that thing when you're young that you had. I certainly felt it when I walked into that newsroom with all these journalists, most of whom were older than me, that I had to somehow get their authority and I had to run this extraordinary newspaper. And I did it for 10 years, but I remember thinking it was easier when I was younger and my head was a bit clearer and I had that fearless thing than when I was a bit older. Hmm. Hey, listen, I can remember the time Rupert Murdoch and their paper, they were they were had they had like ransoms out, they're not like rewards out they can get you can get pictures of certain celebrities in awkward hmm. positions and hmm. stuff. Yeah, but listen, the, the British tabloids are rough and they tumble. Were murdering. Rough listen, and tumble. Dude, I'm gonna tell you the difference between the Americans and the English um, tabloids, right? Um the American people want wants to sue you for money. The tabloids want to to, uh, ruin your reputation mm. Mm. in England. They just want sm- to smuck, fucking make you look put terrible. smuck out there on you. They well, don't, I would, I would they don't even want any money. They just want to put the, <laughs> the fucking the smuck out there. I was slightly, I was slightly buy ca- them off. Let me, <laughs> they do wow. it for free, Mike. If I could slightly counter with a, a counter punch here early on, uh, <laughs> defending my old profession. What I would say is that the British papers they love to build people up. They love to knock them down, and they love a redemption story as well. They love them coming back. So it's tough. It's rough. <laughs> it's like being a – I always felt like you're in a in a prize fight every day. You know, you're in a rough and tumble newsroom. You're covering rough stories, rough people, and it was uh, – you know, you had to be tough to do it. But it reminded me of being in a fight half the time. It's it so was. interesting. And also, I, I mean, I, they love that here in America too. Not though. like Eng- mm. oh, England. Just a, listen, I mean, just to build the someone idolize up. You, idolization is such a massive um, fucking following in mm. England and those um, UK neighborhoods. Idolizing is just, they have great things to idolize. You know what I mean? They mm. they have the great um, the English warriors and stuff. They, have, mm. they even have the guys from the IRA. They have the Cray brothers. All those guys. They make those guys into legends, mm. folklore. They're almost superheroes, gods. Yeah. Quite true. I mean, the Cray twins that might cited there were gangsters from the East End of London. They shouldn't really have been heroes to anybody, and yet now, still, after they long after they both died, the Cray twins, they're revered in many parts of East London, certainly, uh, because they, you know, they had a, a a hold over their people where they they looked after the women and the kids and everything else. They only fought their own, as they put it. There was a kind of honor amongst thieves. I used to felt. write Reggie Cray when I was in prison. Oh, you did? Yeah. And he wrote back to you? Yeah, he wrote me first. Really? I wrote him back, yeah. Wow. What did you discuss with him? Um, he was telling me about his life. And I was discussing what I was doing here and how I feel about being here and what I'm going to do when I get out. And when I came out... Um, so that was when you were in prison? Yeah, so when I came out the prison, I was, I, was, I was fighting somebody. I think it was Julius France. I was coming out to fight somebody. It was a big fight. And I gave my respects. So I went to visit his family, and I was talking kindly about him. And they almost sent me out of the country back to America. Mm. Wow. Yeah. I mean, he was, you know, I, I had some dealings with him. You they, did? They were tough guys. I mean, they, they you know, the, the 60s in London. So they, you know, prison must have thought he's such a sweet man. He was very well behaved in prison. Yeah. They, they both were. Man. I mean, Ronnie, his brother, was in Broadmoor, which was more of a psychiatric prison. Yeah, Ronnie was really out there. Huh? Yeah, he was slightly madder, I'd say. Re- Reg was in a conventional prison, wasn't he? Um, yes. At Parkhurst and then Maidstone, I think. But they, they were, you know, fascinating parts of English folklore. They were folk heroes to many people. And the Richardsons and stuff. I was at John's in a restaurant, Mike, about three years ago with some old village friends. And this guy came to our table immaculate in a smart suit and beard and everything he came over and he introduced himself to me and thank god i was friendly <laughs> he said he said uh, mr morgan i wonder if, um, I, I think he said my wife would like to have a photograph with us of course no problem anyway. did all that and then we had a little chat and he walked off and the maitre d of the restaurant came over and said do you know who that is i went no he said that's charlie richardson yeah, they're fucked. They're From the Richardson them. gang. Now, they were the rival gang With the cray, to the craze. They, they were they, killing each other. I mean, they, they were killing, killing, killing a lot of people. So I was very glad I was friendly to him. They'll kill you if you say, I'm not afraid of you. I'm not afraid of you. They'll kill you. You're not afraid of me? Boom. <laughs> That's so intense, Whoa. man. Whoa. Do you think there's something to it being an older, um, an older section 
of the world, you know, than America. America is very young. I feel like there's not much. The identity gets so blurred sometimes. England was so many countries this. before it was England, right? Well, it's, it's interesting. It's probably take, different inhabitants that England. Well, it's interesting. I mean, America, in. right? America has a reputation worldwide of being a very violent country, uh-huh. particularly with the guns and everything else. And I always say to people, even though I've been, I've campaigned against the guns uh, to try and put some control on it. But I always say you have to understand America is a very young country yeah. and that Britain, when it was a young country, was constantly at war with people. Mm. Constantly, Everyone had a gun in those right. days in Britain. Same with Germany, same with Japan, Australia. So a lot of countries that used to have a lot of guns but are older countries, I think, you know, eventually came to a more peaceful scenario with their, with their countries and their people. America still seems to me is a, it's a fantastic country in so many ways. But it's, Absolutely. But it, yeah. it's we're big still, and... We're still fear-driven. But you're fear-driven. Mm, I think yeah. a lot of paranoia in America. I think a lot of medication mm-hmm. uh, is, yeah. is part of the problem. 80% of the world's painkillers are taken in America. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy. a staggering statistic. Staggering. You have all the opioid crisis. You have everything. And you have this, this gun culture, which doesn't seem strange to Americans. But, it, God, it seems strange to everybody else. I mean, you know, I was... Interesting. I, I mean, for example... In Britain, we have, we're fifth of the size of America. And in Britain, we have 32 gun deaths a year on average. America will have eight, 80 people today <laughs> die from guns yeah. and tomorrow and the next day. 32,000 a year. Another 70,000 get hit by gunfire but don't die. They're saved by surgeons. And I always say, look, it's the, the, the strange thing for me, I've got my, two of my sons here. And one of them, he's six foot one, six foot two, long hair, beard, everything, right? Yeah. And I tried to get him a non-alcoholic beer at Gladstone's in Malibu, right? The restaurant. This is a couple of years ago. And, it, and they wouldn't serve him a non-alcoholic beer without ID. I said, it's non-alcoholic. When it has 0.001% alcohol, right. we're not allowed to give him a non-alcoholic beer. The same month up in Arizona, an eight-year-old girl was at a, a gum range called Bullets and Burgers. And she was being taught how to fire guns for her birthday party. And this f- former Marine was teaching her. And you, the parents were videoing this with their phone. And you see her take ever bigger, more powerful guns. And eventually he gives her an Uzi submachine gun, an eight-year-old kid. And she goes pop, pop, and then the, everything goes nuts. The video, gets, because she lost control and she shot the guy in the head, the Marine, and killed him. And to me, these two things happening... In the space of the right. same month, yeah. a six foot two inch, twenty three year old kid, guy, can't get a non alcoholic beer because he hasn't got his ID on him, and an eight year old girl can fire an Uzi machine gun and kill somebody legally. I know that's it's bad. Fucking too, but crazy. The, but you have to look how we look in this country too. You know, we have our young, we have our young daughters out here. We have our sons out here, and there's animals out here. They're disrespectful animals out here. Fuck you. Mm-hmm. Yes, do whatever he wants to your daughter or your son. Fuck you. Do it. Do what you want. They, you call a cop. The cops do not. We go to court. He didn't. He done nothing mm-hmm. to you. He just said fuck you. He may have touched you. This is not nothing. He might have going scared to you. He just scared you. He done nothing to you. And then again, if he can harass, he drives her insane. What do you want her to do? How does she defend herself? I think I, I'm not at all saying America has to give up all his guns. I understand there are so many guns out there that people want to defend themselves. But I do think there ought to be, in my opinion, take all the school shootings, right? These mass shootings that go on at schools tend to be slightly unhinged kids, 19, 20, 21, who, yeah. you know, something wrong with them. Medicated. They're on the spectrum, right? Over-medicated, playing these video games 20 hours a day and so on. And they have such easy legal access to semi-automatic rifles. Yeah. And it's that where I think, come on, America. Well, a lot of these you, guys are You're empowering these kids to commit mass murder. I agree murder. that too. You know, but what they don't say, a lot of parents teach their, their children how to hunt, how to... I'm, I'm supportive of that. Yeah. My brother's a British Army colonel, right? He's in Afghanistan right now serving with Americans, right, in, mm. in Kabul. I, I don't have a problem intrinsically with guns to hunt, to do sports shooting, even in America to defend yourself. I get that argument. I do have a problem with 19-year-old nutjob kids getting AR-15s Absolutely. and shooting up schools. Yeah. Yes, it's um, Americans' big problem is our fear. We don't want to be humiliated. We don't want to be embarrassed in front of anyone. Yeah. But you see, what I would say, Mike, is that here's the difference. In Britain, we have lots of fights, right? Yeah. Lots of people get into fights on a pub on a Friday night. They get in a fight. 
The difference here is a lot of little fights very quickly become a gun shoot. Yeah. You know, a little argument, a dispute, people crashing into each other by mistake, and then out come the guns. And before you know it, it's all over and people are dead. In Britain, that doesn't happen because they don't have the tools <coughs> to kill each other. We have a knife problem, but it's nowhere near as big as the gun. I know in Ireland, they don't give a damn. Right? Yeah, well. They shoot you there. Yeah. In Ireland, yeah. well, they got you got a gang issue with guns in Ireland. But huh. In England, in England, we had a mass shooting in 1996. Sixteen school children, very similar to Sandy Hook, got killed, and we banned basically all guns from civilian use. Mm. And that's why we have we haven't had a school shooting since. Sandy Hook happened in 2012. I was on air at CNN, mm. and 20 kids got killed. Nothing got done to stop it happening again. There have been 250 school shootings since Sandy Hook. Now, as a parent, you're a parent, right? Absolutely. I'm a parent. I don't know if you're a parent, yeah. but parents should be looking at this going, come on. This is our kids should not be going to no, school. This is not, worrying about this being not what shot we up. do in America. In America, we teach our kids you don't take no shit from nobody. Right. right. You know what I mean? You but the take, problem with that if he's too big, you yeah. get something for him. Yeah. That's what how I'm taught. Mm -hmm. If he's too big, you get something. You get your gun, you get your knife, yeah. you get your bat. That's how we taught. What do you think of that? What I think about that, mm. I think that is really um, primis, primitive thinking. Mm. How do you change the thinking? Excuse me? How do you change the thinking? By teaching them how to love that gentleman. Go on, walk with my child. Show me the person that you have that indication with and showing them we, we don't need to do this. See, people like you can change thinking. Yeah. With, with great respect to myself, when I was at CNN, you know, a British guy sounding like George III is not going to be the best person to make Americans give up their guns. Mike Tyson could make people change their mind about the aggression and the violence that so many people feel Definitely. in America. I think. You know, I want to know what he hates about himself so much that he wants to kill that guy. Right. You know, what is it about him that he hates about himself that he wants that guy dead? Right, right. Because that's what it always comes down to, is how much pain that, that individual is in. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And we don't approach that at all in America. We don't approach the, the mental the, health. I, well, you see, but I argue this. Every country has mental health problems, right? Britain mm. has lots of mental health problems. What you have to do is stop the people that are on that spectrum of mental illness or have problems from easy access to killing machines. That's easy. I mean, that should be an easy step. Well, it's step. easy to do, but there has to be a will to do it. Right. And in America, there's no will politically, yeah. the NRA and others, to do anything at all. So nothing ever gets done. And most countries, were, I mean, look at New Zealand, right? New Zealand had this appalling mass shooting at the mosque mm, in, yes. uh, a few weeks ago. And within two weeks, they had banned all semi-automatic rifles and guns, right? Gone. Done. They've had their massacre. They're not having another one, or they're going to make it incredibly difficult to do that. I don't think anyone needs a semi-automatic weapon don't. to defend themselves. I don't you either, really but don't. how do we change this mentality in America? They're afraid to get beat up in front of their children and wives. Yeah, I get it. You have to okay, change the Okay, I'm afraid for you to smack me, and I can't. you're too strong for me to fight you back or do anything, and you disrespect me in front of my children and wives. Well, what how did you change? Do? Because you've changed. Excuse me, huh? You've changed over the years, right? Yeah. You, you went from that kid when you were 13 and being arrested all the time and fighting all the time and everything. You became this guy. So how did you do that? Because um, I find that really interesting, how you I don't know. evolved. I, I, um, I had good friends. I had, um, I had a good I had a, what did I have? A good support system, so to speak. Right, hit, hit absolute rock bottom. Absolutely. And that guy had to disappear because that guy was too, totally too toxic for my existence. And do you remember a moment, Mike, when you thought, I need to change. Do you remember what that moment was? No, I never. Um, it was never I need to change. It was always I had to change or I was going to die. Mm. It was never I need to change. This was never. It was never because hey, Mike, this is a, this is um, a, a behavior I'm dealing with. It was my life I was dealing with. There was no way I could exist mm. continuing on. But a lot of people in America, I think, have that kind of anger and despair about the life they're living. But they also, they, they get brought up in a, a angry and aggressive environments and they have firearms or whatever it may be. It's a, it's a dangerous cocktail. What's happening to our kids is terrifying and we're creating a generation of ang anxious written yeah. kids who then, 
They're killing themselves. Yeah. They're getting sucked into depression and heavy medication. They're committing mass murder in some cases. And I've got a theory about this. We just got to, in this battle with mental health, don't talk about mental health. There's mental illness mm. and there should be mental strength. Mm. How do you, we teach kids every day in school how to be good at maths or how to be good at, you know, sciences or any of these things. We should be teaching mental strength and resilience. Mm. How do you deal with life? Yeah. You know, how do you absolutely. put things into perspective? Well, and what, yeah. From what degree do we deal with life? You have to look um, from what level of degree. How right. do we deal from life? You know what I mean? Uh, uh, what do you got? Uh, one of those sh um, guys, um, those swamis may think life is a different perspective mm -hmm. from a different dimension, you know? I mean, I think everyone... They look at life different from from where we may look at it from a different perspective. Oh, completely. And listen, my upbringing in a little leafy village in the south of England compared to your upbringing, right? Completely different. However, however, the, the similarities are everybody has to face shit at some stage, Yeah. Right. You're going to lose loved ones that you care desperately about. You're going to have things go wrong in your life. You're going to get fired. You're going to get, you know, things going to happen. When you lose, this is interesting. Now we go to the, when you lose those loved ones in your life, what do you think? You, even though we continue to live our life, I lost a daughter, four year old daughter mm -hmm. a few years ago, right? I remember. But Dick, um, I think I know when this is over, I'm going to be with her. Yeah. And we'll be together. I, be I believe that. Yeah. I believe that. I mean, my father died when I was one, for example. And a lot of people have that kind of thing in their lives, you know. But my stepfather came along and took on two kids, you know, young boys in his mid twenties, and the, and he's, you know, my dad. And every year that goes by, when I think about what he did and the sacrifice he made, my, you know, love and uh, feelings for him strengthened. Can you imagine being twenty one, take on that kind of responsibility. Right. I mean, amazing. You know, when I think about my my eldest son, there is he's out there. He's twenty six. You know. Um, he's the same age my dad was when he came along and scooped up two kids. And, and it's, you know, the, people do extraordinary things, don't they? But I yeah. think that it, it, I try and teach my sons just life is, you know, it's that old Rocky thing, isn't it? Life really is about, it's not about how hard you can hit, right? Yeah. Anyone can punch something. How many times? Not as well out? as you. No. It, it's how many times you get up when you get hit and you get knocked down and you're in a bad place. Can you get up? And get on. The one thing I think I've always looking back at my career, my life is when I've been dealt blows, I've always tried to write. Okay, let's just now you got to get up and get going again. And I just don't think enough kids these days get taught this. Actually taught it. This is how you. This is how you become more resilient. This is how you deal with crap in your life. This is how you deal with stuff when it goes wrong. And they, and they you know, I I hate things like. At school now, participation prizes for everybody. No, no, that's not how it goes. Right? That's not Terrible. life. Life isn't about everyone wins and everyone gets a partition prize. Right? Life's about people winning and losing and dealing people with People must folks. understand competition. Competition is not like I'm better than you. Competition is the teachers. When we get mature, we won't give in under the slightest struggle. Yeah. yeah. Right. And also, you know? yeah. it, until you lose, you don't know the joy of winning. Yeah, absolutely. Right? You can win, win, yeah. win. But when you lose, then the next time you win, it means, well, look at Tiger Woods, right? We were talking about this before we came yeah, out here. Yeah, yeah. Tiger Woods, no, nobody has had the highs and lows that that guy's had, right? Not even you, Mike, with respect, could probably compare career-wise to what went on with Tiger Woods, where he's the number one golfer arguably in history. Right? And he's a black golfer in a white sport who transformed it completely. Yeah. And built a generation of kids to come through and be athletes and everything. Amazing uh, trailblazer. And then it all goes horribly wrong. He's hit by scandal after scandal. His body collapses. He's number 1,199 in the world 18 months ago. He's done. He's finished. There's a brilliant video clip of Tiger Woods being shown people trolling him, you know, critics, yeah, yeah. other sports He's people. done. He's done. He's finished. And Tiger's watching all this, He'll right? never win again. Never win again. He's finished. And he shouldn't have won again. But the only person in the end who believed he could win again was Tiger Woods. Tiger, yeah. And he won the Masters, and it was an amazing moment of not even redemption. This was revenge. This was you lot can suck it because I just <laughs> all of you wrong. And you had a little, you got a picture out there, and it's Frank Sinatra. And it says the best revenge is massive success. That's true. It's so true, right? That's right. Absolutely, yeah. Whatever anyone says, you know. Yeah. I, mean, I remember watching you, Mike, when I when you first came on the scene. I'd never seen anything like it. I never have since. You were the most ferocious, incredible, 
fighter I've ever watched. It was the most exhilarating, exciting thing to watch you in those black shorts, getting in that ring, your neck twitching. Even I, thousands of miles away in England, I was collapsing in fear, and I didn't I didn't go anywhere near you. And I remember it like the Michael Spinks fight when he's just staring at you, and you're thinking, Spinks is unbeaten. Right, he should be like ready for this, and his legs start to wobble, and the whole thing's over before you get near him. And I remember thinking, this guy, no one's ever going to beat this guy. And then you got hit by your problems. You got hit by a few blows on and off, you know, in the ring, out of the ring, and you had to somehow deal with that. And for a top sportsman who's been completely unbeatable, that's tough. It's a hard thing, isn't it? No, because in life you have to understand. Well, yeah, you can be, you know, in in sports, you know, everyone's beaten in sports. Every, you know, we're designed to be beaten in sports. Mm. But what are we gonna do after that? Because that's a small increment of our life. Mm. What are we gonna do after that? Are we gonna uh, are we gonna give up because the, we're gonna believe this is the best moment of our life and we no longer have it because we don't possess that crown mm. that calls us this? I don't know, a champion, a king, or whatever you are. Mm-hmm. We have to continue to go on improving ourselves as human beings. What was the, what was the greatest moment for you of your career? If I could replay one for you now, what would you choose? I don't know. Um, when I was sixteen, I went and fought this man in um, Boston, Massachusetts. He was um, I was I was fifteen, sixteen. He must have been twenty eight. He beat me, but it was really close. I, I thought I had fought my best fight then. And that's the one you that's the one you'd remember. Yeah, that's, that's so fascinating. awesome. It's fascinating. Because it told you that you, you had what it took? Yeah, but maybe it was giving me a standing ovation. Oh. You love that feeling? Yeah, because I lied about my age. And everybody, they knew who I was. And they know some guy knew I lied. They, they said, you're 15. Because, you know, everybody, I was on the stage and I was like, you know, I was a young guy. He just won the junior national championships twice. They thought I was a guard. I was only 16, 15 years old. And this guy... I would fight him. He, I was the last fight he turned professional, but he was just so intelligent fighter. He was smart. I never fought a guy. I know it was just. I said, "Wow, it was a great fight." Everybody was standing ovation, but he won. And I, but wow. I thought I won, but I said, "Wow, that was just my greatest performance." I gave it all I had. See, isn't that fa- isn't that fascinating? <laughs> I gave it isn't all it? I had. So, so you awesome. cho- you choose a moment that nobody, I bet, no Mike Tyson fan in the world would have thought would have ever thought that would be the moment you'd have chosen. It's an amazing answer. Yeah. And yet, I can see as you relive it why that meant so much to you. I cried all the way home. You did? Uh, From Boston to New York. Oh, upstate New York, all the way home, yeah. Really? Yeah. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. No, it was Rhode Island. It was Rhode Island to New York. I cried all the way home. What happened to that guy, do you know? The guy you No, I saw him before. Um, I saw him again at a professional fight. I must have had two amateur fights, two professional fights, but then he, he had turned professional. He didn't do well in professional. I saw him, I gave him a hug. And I was just always so clean and pure. And I saw him, I gave him a hug. I smell him, he had a lick on his breath, mm. you know? And he, he went a different way in life. Interesting. But that experience that he gave me made me a better individual. Amazing. Wow. I'll never forget him. Do you remember his name or not? Um, Beanie. Beanie. Yeah. You know, you can remember that. Isn't that amazing? That's such an amazing story, dude. Great fighter, too. Fascinating. Man. I was doing this as a kid ever since I was 14, 13. That's all I ever did. Mm. No breaks or nothing. All I ever did, I lived with cuss. That's all we ever did. Our whole perspective was about fighting, the concept of fighting, the, psych- psych- the psychic of fighting. Do you ever think what, what would have happened to you if you'd never met cuss? Um, no, because it was ordained by God for me to meet him. Mm. Me thinking what would have happened is incidental. It means nothing. It doesn't exist. Because when I've interviewed you before, I remember you saying that the thing, the absolute thing he instilled in you was was discipline. That everything, everything with him was about discipline. Everything to do what I mm. to do what I hated to do, but do it like I love it. Mm. Mm. And did you hate it, or did you? I hate training. You know, who loves who really training. loves training every every day. Mm. And I don't care how much of a killer you are in the ring. When you're in the sparring ring, some sparring partners be kicking your ass <laughs> and you're frustrated. Almost dropping. You get mad, boom, and he almost drops you, so you got to keep your cool and not get mad. And it's just, it's, 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 it's complex sport. I remember asking Freddie Roach. I went up to his gym here. And I asked Freddie, when was the only, have you ever been scared, you know, when you've been doing a session with somebody? And he laughed. He went, well, there was a time when Mike came in and he was in a really bad mood and... Things got pretty, pretty, 
lively in the ring. <laughs> I, I really can't believe I was that guy. You know, when I hear about that guy, people say they had scary stories of me and mm. stuff. And I used to say, I'm a guy. You know. Um, Does it seem like another person to you now? Um, do you ever feel that might now? I mean, do you ever get involved in a situation where suddenly you feel the old feelings? Or? No, I know who that guy was, though. You know, before I didn't understand that mm. guy. I know who that guy was. That guy, is, he's afraid. You know, he's insecure. You have to love him. People know that he's, he's really deserved love. When was the last time you actually hit someone in anger? Wow, okay. I don't remember. It, ha it happened um, in California. I know it must have been, I had a reporter. I was coming back from England, and I had a reporter, and um, I was high, too. I just did some cocaine right before I got on the, the plane from England. And as soon as I went, and I was still high, so I didn't get no rest. And as soon as I, as soon as I was ready to go sleep, boom, I, was, I dropped. So I'm irritated going, this yeah. guy's filming me, and then I clocked the guy. Oh. Yeah. yeah, and uh, now I see the guy at the airport all the time. We always talk. He's a good friend. We went through the Susu. I really? 25. That's I know nice. I gave him some money, and so we're cool, and we're friends I now. bet he doesn't take your picture with no, he permission. Doesn't, I let him take a picture. No, don't be that way. You should shoot yeah. me. I really have a great deal of respect for him now. And that was the last time? It was a few years yeah. ago, though, right? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I had my children with me, my wife, my mother-in-law with me. I was a pig. Oh, God. So embarrassed, you know? So embarrassed. But that's quite a few years ago, right? Yes. So you've you've learned real self discipline about. I learned that um that I was that guy one time, and I need to have been struck a lot of times too. It's just that I had the the stigma that protected me and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I understand that we all make mistakes in life, and we're just here learning, and it's almost over. I was a young kid. I was heavyweight champ. I was a homeless child not too long ago, and boom, I'm 52. It's almost over. Where did that time go? What did I actually learn? How did I get here? What's my purpose for? Do you, do you, what do you people? say to your kids about life? What, do you, what, what advice do you give them? Excuse me? What do you say to your kids about life? I explain to them. They get out of life what they put in life, you know? You have to go into life with a great deal of dignity, honor, and respect, but a great deal of determination as well, you know? And I try to explain that to them. And, but it's so difficult for me to explain that to them when these guys are in a nice little mansion, the house is clean, they got tutors and maid, and, and I say to myself, what the fuck am I trying to say to you? Because that's not even an existence to them. They're, they don't even believe that. They still attack me and strike me. They don't think I'm no tough guy. And sometimes I think, because of some of my success and what I've done in life, I think I, I stole that from my kids. They can't see the reality of where I came from. Mm -hmm. Their grandmother and their grandfather was um, pimps and prostitutes, and they lived in a very dark, vice life, and these kids live in the light, you know? Mm -hmm. And I call that elevation. Mm -hmm. Evolution, excuse me. Evolution, oh, yeah, I get yeah. it completely. It's a different world, isn't it? Yes. It's a different world. Exactly, the different world. Sometimes my whole life I thought I was a, you know what I mean, fucking the god of the savages. Look where I came from. I hate it. I felt sorry for myself. Had chips on my shoulder because I was always poor. I was uneducated. Fuck it. I'm a monster. Watch me rain and all that stuff. And I just found that I'm a little scary boy. I'm not no tough guy. Were you ever scared in the ring? Oh, petrified. Really? Yeah, I was just a disciplined fight. I was always petrified. Even my, at your peak? My first pro fight. My first pro fight. I remember feeling the fight when they match you up. That's the guy you fight. And so I went outside. To, I don't know, to go for a walk. I was getting ready to get on the plane, train, and I come back. I was so scared. Hmm. And even at your peak when you were the world heavyweight champ? Yeah, exactly. You know, you have to have fear. I can't imagine participating in any kind of combat sport without it. Isn't that interesting? That's fascinating to me because I can't yeah. imagine... But when I, knew, when I watched you I in the knew, ring, I knew fear from a different perspective. I knew fear from my mother and father not being respected, from my father being arrested a lot, from just being a street person living in fucking abandoned buildings, not having food. So I knew what you know fear was and stuff, and I and I knew what it was like to be bullied by people, and I know what it was like to be afraid by the neighborhood tough guys. And I just brought that darkness with me. Once cause helped me with the other part of it. Fascinating. I went to see Mike's one-man show in Vegas, took my three sons, and we sat in a booth in the 
And it was such a surprising show because it wasn't about boxing at all, really. It was about life. And you were there. You had your white suit. You had this lovely gospel choir you had. It was... Oh, the trip, right? That's oh. sick, right? <laughs> he right? saw the first one it before was, Spike got involved. It was fun. But honestly, I loved it. I loved the simplicity of it and you just telling your story. And it was such a uh, really inspiring story because you didn't make it all about, look at me knocking people out. I mean... We did come away thinking Brad Pitt's very lucky to be alive. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fuck That's yeah. what we did come away with. But um, no, it was really, it was very interesting to me. And I've interviewed you a number of times over the years and always found you, you've got such a complexity of layers about you as a human being. Yeah. Very, you're a very complex character. And yet that makes you a fascinating person to interview. Yeah. Because you have such a good perspective on so many things because you've been so such dark places as well as good stuff. Yeah. And that's most people don't get to some of the places you've been to. They, they can't understand what that is like. That's why, in a way, I think some of these big debates America's now having, it'll be people like you that can have a real effect and influence on people because they look at you and they, they relate to you in a way they would never relate to someone like me. You really think so? I do. Yeah, man. I do, yeah. It's because you were the epitome of a warrior, you know, with your ferocity and your just your attitude and your energy and everything you brought into the ring, man, for you to then talk about how you felt fear in the ring. And then, I mean, Mike, I mean, let me just acknowledge, dude, for you to wrap up and understand that all of your fear you gathered from when you were a little kid and you brought all of that with you into the <laughs> ring, man. Wow. For you to be able to articulate that it transforms people because people go oh fuck i'm not alone i'm fucking terrified and i'm not alone and mike tyson a god among men has felt fear and feels fear it's powerful man yeah that's the real deal mm -hmm. it's powerful and that's why you know that's why this show is is so fucking important what we're doing man have Pierce come on, have these people come on, and we talk about life. How do we teach our kids, you know, that even in this life where all of these resources are provided for you, you still need to have grit and tenacity, and you still need to understand that life is not all fucking butterflies and cupcakes. And you're not supposed to be happy all the time. Nobody is. But that's the thing. I think the problem that kids have they have two things, I think. One is the Instagram phenomenon, yeah. where every kid's on Instagram and all they're seeing all the time is a life they would love. Right. And they see perfect images and perfect pictures. Everything is airbrushed, everything is cleansed to show perfection, an unobtainable perfection. Even the supermodels can't look as good right. as these pictures, right? And so you're chasing an impossible dream. It's not the conventional American dream, which is achievable, which is if you work really hard and have a passion for something, you have a you can succeed in this country. You have a good chance. This is an unobtainable dream. You're never going to look as perfect as these people are pretending to be. So you have a pretense around a dream, yes. which is damaging. And secondly, I think the kids, you know, they're always on them. I've got a seven-year-old girl as well, and I've got three much bigger boys, but they're all on their phones all the time. I'm on my phone all the time. You know, we, we all do it. But... Of course. I, I, I was interviewed by Dr. Phil for his podcast recently. We were talking about why is it that kids are so much more anxious generally about the world, mm. you know, and about stuff that's going on. And he made a really interesting point that, of course, what technology's done is it's brought the world to people's phones, yes. right? So in the old days, if something happened now in Chicago or Seattle, right, you know, an alligator killed somebody or something, right, we wouldn't know about it here. Right. You wouldn't know that happened, Right. Now you're going to see a video of this alligator eating a guy. Yeah, and then, and you're going to see it within then 20 descending. minutes. Then, I just saw it on television. Right. Then the sin, they had the foot in the leg and then went right. into the water. And you're going to see it happening within 15 what minutes if it happens, just right? Just just right. now. You, right. Know, you, you saw it. Right. So there you go. So we would never have known that even happened. Right. So now if you're on Twitter all day or Facebook, right, you just think the entire world's going completely nuts. Nuts. When in fact, in, as I say to kids, here's the truth. It's the safest time to ever be alive in recorded yeah. history. Fewer people are being killed than ever recorded before, right? It's the healthiest time 
to ever be alive. Statistically, we're living much longer than we used to, and we're fighting many more diseases exactly. more successfully now, right? It is, you know, in almost every way of measuring life, there's less poverty than there's ever been in the history of planet Listen, Earth. Well, this from Egypt. Um, in Egypt, the height of Egypt is life expectancy. Ex- expertise was um, 35 years old. Right. 35 years old. Can you imagine 35 years old? Right. It's and, crazy. And even in prehistoric time, it was 20. Right. I got so four should, years. So we should tell. Years. So let's tell the kids, years? look, yeah. here's, here's the good news, right? The planet's a pretty good place right now. There are fewer wars than there have ever been historically. You're going to live yeah, longer. I was just thinking, you know? listen, I was just telling one of my kids, I said, can you imagine just going for a walk Back in you know I mean um, the dark ages so to speak, oh, and you're going yeah. forward, woo, woo, and boom, you see you see sixty thousand people, the foreign army at your door, right? Good yeah. God, damn, yeah. it's different now. Ready to just burn the yeah. fucking village to the ground, yeah. yeah. And yet you see Don't this generation think it's the worst yeah, it's yeah. ever been. I know, and we have no need to know that an alligator killed no, a dude in Chicago. None. Like it does us no good. None for our safety, no, for our understanding have, of the world. Is, I agree with you one hundred percent. But know what? Since the beginning of time, we were told that we need to find knowledge for mm-hmm. some reason mm-hmm. and information. Since the beginning yeah. of time, yeah. we now have too much well, information. Even our biblical get, guys say, "Travel, find." Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, learn. Well, we crazy. get a hit of dopamine. Mm-hmm and serotonin when we learn something new because that's how our brain works because every time it wants to reward us every time we do something new that it hasn't seen or experienced before so when you're looking through your instagram feed you're seeing a new thing every second and you're just getting hits of that so listen um ps for instance um, I look at. The, I normally watch police um, pulling over people and harassing people and people being disrespectful to police. I did that stuff, and then I started. Um, I saw um, a picture of me fighting someone, so I started looking at me. And, I started, and every day I started looking at me, and every day, every other day, they had a new story with me about me uh, from somebody I don't even know. They don't even know me, and he's telling people stories about me. You know, for like an hour put together a story and telling people story about me. So I'm finding out so much false information about me mm-hmm. with actual facts about me. It's just blowing my mind. And it gets to the stage where even if you are right. saying it, people won't believe yes. it because they've already been told that's not true. Right. So the truth is getting killed out there. You know, Facebook and all these companies are allowing so much fake news, genuine fake news to be spread. And it's dangerous. It's really bad because it... Um, I think what they're looking for is just um, is spectacularism. You know what mm, I mean? Yeah. Clickbait. Because well, it's what you said. It's the gratification that comes from that hit. And we're now in a world where every everyone wants it instantly. Boom, 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 yeah. boom. It's why people's patience for anything has gone. You know, my favorite sport is cricket. And the reason we love it so much is Americans just don't understand why we would like a sport where you can play five matches of five days each and at the end of it the score might be zero zero and we did it deliberately to confound americans and make sure that you never played it <laughs> so that you could never beat us at Capete. it which is what you would do yeah, yeah. we Wait. must prefer the fact that americans like to have your own sports where you call yourselves the world champions hey listen yeah, america yeah, yeah. We prefer that yeah you know, yeah. You know what you're I mean? all world <laughs> champions even though you're Except the only country that enters americans are great at stealing inventions yes we're yes. the best at it. But you're also the, the best But, but the best thing you do, Mike, is... We invented stealing and then... You, you create sports and then you declare yourselves world champions. Yes. Even yes. though no other country is allowed to enter. I admire that. Well, the Jaguars might be coming to London yes, pretty soon. Yes, I saw soon. that, yeah. I saw that. Well, how do you... I, how y'all think y'all to, can handle that in England? God, man. So as a journalist, I mean, what's your take on fake news and this phenomenon? I mean, it's really started in the last, what? Five years, I think. The, or the, was the Trump? Yeah, yeah I think the internet. Well, Trump has come along. Look, Trump's what he's always been. He's a bullshitter. Right, Let's right. Of course, he yeah. He's somebody that spent his entire life selling buildings, just talking shit. And he starts. He starts off saying this building's worth 150 million. Right. He knows privately he wants 100. Someone says, "Don't be ridiculous. It's worth 40," and they settle on 90. Right, and everyone's happy. Right. He's taken that same mentality to the White House. Now, some of the stuff he does, I think, is is good. And it's working. Some of it, I wish he'd, he'd stop being so petty 
and pathetic in some ways, unpresidential. But ultimately, Trump will be judged on his actions, not his words. And, you know, I, I suspect he might get reelected. How do you have I, this? Dude, I, I don't tell me, listen. Disagree. And this, um, I don't know. And this civilization of Trump, man, this is just a guy that's on fire. Yeah. And his own constituencies. He's on fire there. I wasn't necessarily asking about him as much no, no, as the fake, fake news, news yeah. thing. The thing about fake news is I don't, uh, I don't blame Trump for that. Right? I think he's okay. just, he's come along at a time when... He's just sort of... he's The he's, internet is to blame. Right, Twitter right. and Facebook and these companies, all of which I use as a consumer, they have not been strong enough and tough enough in cracking down on fake news. Trump, for, Trump, for better or worse, he, he lets you know what he's thinking in real time. He can't exactly. help, right? He's telling you yeah, what he's he saying, he good, bad, and ugly. That. Some of it is ugly. Some of it is good. I think he's a fascinating political animal. Yeah, uh, it's fascinating. But I think we the need fake, to the talk fake, to Trump. Um, Tyson like, Rance needs to talk to Trump. He should. He's taken his message to social media, which allows him to talk directly <laughs> to the public and bypass everybody. Right? That's yes. what really pisses the. Yeah, extreme. I know. He doesn't do it. He's, he's totally he's, non-conventional. He's and he is what he is. And down in the middle of America, I, I go there a lot. They love Trump for all the reasons that the coasts don't like him. Right. They love Trump. Yeah. They love it, him sticking it to the media. They love him sticking it to everyone. Right, right. Uh, defending himself. But, you know, if you read The Art of the Deal, his book, it's all in there. Yeah. There's nothing Trump is doing now which is any different to the Trump in that book. This is the guy he's always been. Absolutely. That's why he won. You know, it's still like it, the in, conversation Trump, hasn't in, changed. Putting Trump supports Mike Tyson. It's one of those things. Yeah. And that's I'm just like, you know, I mean, that's pretty weird. Man. Well, he loves boxers because so, I did. I did the Celebrity Apprentice yeah. season one with him, and I was in there with Lennox Lewis and Tito Ortiz, who I know yeah. did this podcast. And I, I ended up winning it. I knocked out Lennox in the semi-final. Holy fun. moly! Yeah. yeah, Lennox, if you're watching, I knocked you out. He's watching bang. too. Ah! Bang bang! <laughs> and Lennox's last words to me before we went in for the oh, final border, he no. said, "He said I'm going to get this." He said because. Donald Trump loves boxers. I went, mate, I'm knocking oh, you out. Man. What do you think of the Mueller report? Well, it's, it's look, th this was designed to investigate Russian collusion. Right. right. So the whole point of the Mueller investigation was that everyone kept saying Trump colluded with the Russians right. to fix the election. So he's a fake president who shouldn't be there. The Mueller report's come back and it's completely exonerated Trump of any collusion. Of that, right. Not only Trump, but any of his campaign team. It's also exonerated any American. There's no evidence of any American whatsoever right. actively colluding with the Russians to fix the election. There are, I think, bigger questions to answer about the obstruction of justice uh, stuff. But on that, I would simply take the bigger picture. This is Trump basically reacting badly to fake allegations of collusion. Right. And so if you take away the fake allegation of collusion, you have none of his erratic angry behavior, which is now being categorized as obstruction. It's like chicken and the egg. You know, there is no chicken. I, the Mueller report is, if you imagine that as the, as the overarching thing, there's no obstruction without the allegation of fake collusion, which turned out to be fake. So I have a lot of sympathy for Trump on this. I think that he, he was falsely accused of colluding with the Russians. And it was, they were saying it delegitimized his election win, and he took it very badly. I think all the behavior that they're now saying was obstructing justice came out of him feeling pissed off, quite rightly, that cable news was 24-7 pounding him for collusion, which in the end was proven not to have happened. So I've got sympathy for him on it. But, you know, they're out to get him. And yeah. but I'm not sure it's a clever story. They want to watch him burn. And I, I think it's a, it's a mistake by the Democrats in particular because I think it will help get Trump reelected. I Dude, think, uh, I'm, really I'm telling that. people myself, Pierce, I'm like, man, he's going to get reelected, dude. You can't, you can't keep hammering a guy like him uh, without people who support him feeling even more strongly they want to support right. him. Yeah. So actually it empowers his base, and I think the Democrats don't have a candidate yet that can beat him. Uh, and I'm, I'd be very interested who they put up against him, because you need someone who's going to be very tough and I don't see who that person is. It's, it would be like putting someone up to fight Mike in his prime, right? Who is that person? Everyone thought it was someone like Michael Spinks, and he, you know, he collapsed in front of you. <laughs> so who is this person that can beat Trump? It's all very well screaming about him, yeah. and saying what a monster he is. Right. But at some stage in 2020, and it's coming up fast. It's coming up this real fast. Is 18 months, right? It's real fast. And Trump is and already no, raising and, and, and so much money. There's nobody even close. There's no. no one even close yet. No. 
I'm hey, let's look at Trump when he's young when we did Pepsi commercials. All right. The Trump and Pepsi commercials. Mm. Oh going back, this is when he was a young guy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> do you remember, remember when he was young, Pierre? I do. I do. He was very, uh, you know, he was a very interesting character, Trump. I mean, for what, 30, 40 years he's been in the news, hasn't he? He's a, yeah. big, he's a big figure. It's not like he suddenly came along. Everyone knew who Trump was. They just never imagined he could become president. But I, I thought he could. I, the moment he said he was running, I told people, you watch this. I wrote I columns too. about it, yeah. Look at Youngie, look at this. Yeah. <laughs> Was that for your fight? Yeah, we, got, we did a lot of commercials. We, we had a bomb back then, dude. That's fucking cool. Did you speak to him after he won? Have you seen him since? No, no. No. I think we will though soon. Mm. We're gonna to talk to him about this weed thing, man. Mm. Yeah, what do you, let's talk about yeah. the weed thing. So yeah, let's talk about. You know, it. where I come from in England, uh, obviously this is illegal. You know, you couldn't do this um, in yeah. public in the way that you are. And yet, I've watched the way in California things have gone, and it appears on the face of it to have been very successful. And whether you call it recreational or med or medicinal, people who are using cannabis recreationally are using it to medicate some issue that they're dealing with. People hey, self-medicate with people alcohol. Drink themselves into there's grain. No, right. Listen, there's no, there's day, right? no AA in Britain, okay? <laughs> you're a wimp if you go to AA in True. Britain. You in Britain and you in AA, you're a fucking pussy. Wow. Okay? That's All a I nice know is we man. drink an awful lot, and yet the same people that drink, 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 go, oh, we couldn't possibly legalize cannabis. I'm like, trust me, you should be on cannabis, not alcohol. Yeah. Because that's doing a lot worse for you than cannabis would. I Absolutely. Think. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, from the medicinal side, it interacts with our endocannabinoid system. You know, I'm sure you know all about that. Very familiar with it. Yeah. <laughs> actually, I oh, am. I, actually I believe that you are. I did a show on this with yeah. Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Exactly. We exactly. Actually, we actually tried it on air. I figured. Um, what about psychedelic you really? drugs? You ever experienced that? I have before? not tried psychedelic Never. drugs. Never? Psilocybin? Oh, man, it's changed my whole life. Really? Yeah. Well, like DMT? No, no, and I did LSD when I was like 10 years old before. But listen, right? The fact is that um, I did this to explain to him. Come on, please explain the toad to him. The toad. It's ancient um, medicine, so to speak. Well, cannabis has opened the door for a lot of these plant medicines that are now beginning to emerge across America. Mike did it. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I did. What was it like? It was um, inconceivable. So um, intergalactic, you know? For instance, I, you, I'm in the sky. I'm, I'm just, I die. You take it. I inhaled it. Pff, I exhaled, and I died. I actually died. You have an ego death. You know, I'm afraid I died. Well, you feel like you're dead. No, I am dead. I don't exist. I, my, I have no body. I have no legs. It's just my... My entity. I'm just, I'm just, and I don't know what's going on. I'm scared. And um, I wanted power. This last time I took it, probably two weeks ago or so, three, I wanted power. And I, I got so much power, um, I disintegrated. See, I'm not sure if I feel comfortable about you being empowered by. By toad stuff, no, by the toad it makes you walk around like you're 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 feeling powerful again. No, it, it could be dangerous. Yeah, it could be, but it wasn't. When I was finished, I was in love with love. Really? Yeah, I was in love with love. I realized that everything I wanted was out of fear, and that it was it was something worthy of prayer. Than it wasn't me. It was, and then we know it as God, but it was a big entity, en entity, and it was only I only wanted to worship to it. How many times have you been properly in love in your life? I have no idea. Properly in love, like. Considering myself, yeah, my whole life. <laughs> I mean, I love that. Apart from you, I mean, other people. I don't know. It's so easy for me to fall in love. I fall in love with a pigeon. <laughs> yeah, but you love your pigeon. Yes, I do. How many? Have you still got the pigeons? Yeah. How many do you have? Well, I had a couple of thousand. I probably got. A, I probably got a thousand now. Fifty. What is it you love about a pigeon? It's, um, let's see. Um. My childhood. The first time I ever got into a scuffle was over a pigeon. Why? Somebody took my pigeon and ripped his head off. <sighs> really? 
Yeah. God, it's so <sighs> fucked up. There was a bunch of kids that were coming around the neighborhood. I heard that I had, I had robbed the house and I had some money, so I went and bought some pigeons. I was a pigeon pension fancier, so um, I would put my, I hid the pigeons. So all these guys, one guy that I told him with a brother, he told some other guys. So they came to the neighborhood, stole my pigeon, and um. I was fighting them, so I got all my birds back, but the guy had snuck one of my birds in his jacket and ran, and someone said, Mike, he has one of your birds, and so I went to catch him. I said, can I have my bird, please? He said, fuck you. You want this bird, you fat nigga? He ripped the bird's head off. Do the bird, and my friend said, fight him, Mike, and I fought him. That's the first time I ever fought or won a fight. Really? Wow. Yeah. That was the time? Yeah. Because the guy killed your pigeon? Big time, yeah. First time I ever had a fight or tried to fight somebody. And when, when you're with your pigeons now, what does it bring you? What'd you get out of it? I don't know, it takes me back to my childhood. In what way? That I have to take care of them and protect them. Because of what happened to that pigeon that time? Yeah, somebody had to take them, steal them from me. It's crazy. Yeah, don't, don't even try to explain. It's amazing. Let me explain yeah. to you, it's crazy. Yeah. So you feel like a collective protection thing yeah. for them? You want yeah. to take care of them? Yeah. I, um, I've known people who have thrown people off the roof for their pigeon, like four stories. Off the roof, yeah. That's the kind of world we come from. You steal our shit, we'll kill you, or we'll hurt you real bad. You never steal from anybody again. That's just the mindset. When I could have just gave him a fucking couple of pigeons, we had hundreds of them. <laughs> you know, you could get them. Anybody ever want some birds from me, I would give it to them now. Do they have characteristics that yeah, you really like? Yeah, all different. None of them are the same. They're all different? Yeah, all different. They're like humans? Yeah. There's no, nothing the same. Nothing. Do you get some that are aggressive and some that Very are peaceful? Very aggressive, yeah. That's it's not interesting. It is birthday like people. When you watch them, there's a couple of hundred of them on this side of the roof. The little boxes, probably 12 foot, 12 inches, the boxes, and of course, a couple of hundred of boxes across the wall. And you watch them intact. Some of them are quiet. Some of them stand on top of their box, irritating, irritating other pigeons, starting trouble, messing with other guys, women. The other guy comes in and fights them. Then he goes back to his box. It's just a bunch of shit going on. <laughs> so crazy. Did you talk to them? Huh? Did you talk to them? Yeah, yeah I say I, I could talk to them. I talk to them. Um, what, do you, some, what do you say? Well, I tell him, you know, stop fucking with that one. Stop grab him and <laughs> throw him in this box. Cause he goes over there and beats up on the young bird. You know, it's, it's just a bunch of stuff. It's fascinating. It's awesome. It's like a little community. It's doing nothing but fight and make love and cheat on each other. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's complex. Like, yeah. like humans. Yeah. yeah, just like humans. Everybody's cheating. He has a baby in this box and he got eggs in this box. So he spends his time here. Then when his wife gets on here, he gets on the eggs there. It's just uh. crazy. That's so funny. What do you make of the uh, the fight game at the moment? I don't know. I haven't looked at it too much. You know, they had a really good, f exciting fight with Tyson Fury and yeah. the Hotel Warrior yeah. on um, what's it, Wilder. Yeah. So that's bringing heavyweight, you know, boxing back in this generation because that was really exciting for heavyweight. What do you make of Tyson Fury? Because he's a gypsy at heart, you know. He's a what does that mean that he's the gypsy? Heart? They're kind of not been the gypsy cats, but I just want to know what is. They're, that? They're, tra they're travel a traveling community. Yeah. So they don't have any fixed place. They travel around in caravans. They set up homes wherever they go for a few weeks, a few months, and they very they keep amongst themselves. They're very tough. A lot of the bare knuckle fighting is done by. But a lot gypsies. of them have been very successful businessmen. Yeah, as yeah, well. yeah, 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 you totally. Know? Yeah, they haven't been totally isolated to that that form of life. No, 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 not at all. But they, you know, they people some behave badly and give them a bad name. Many others, I think, are very decent people. And I've met quite a few travelers in my life. They have a very they have specific a code yeah. of life. And they have, mm. they, they have the, the mystic lifestyle. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. know, they live yeah. in the afterlife as well. Yeah. yeah. That's did, interesting. Do you like Anthony Joshua or not? Hey, I really like him. He's like really, um, know what he is? He's really a, uh, a breath of fresh air. Yeah. You know? He's just really, he's really clean. He's really, he really looks clean. He's a clean guy, he's a clean fighter. He's Good punch. He's just, you know, you just wish the best for him. Can someone like that would would anyone as clean as that have beaten Tyson at his peak? I don't know. You know, I don't know. My, my ego said nobody would beat you, but you look at him and you never, know, you know. He just looks beautiful. You know, what <laughs> I mean, he just looks like a fighter. You know, he looks like he was born to do what he has to do. He needs more experience, of course, but that'll come in life. You know, he has. We watched. Uh, 
We went to the Stable Center and watched Lemonchenko the other night. Mm-hmm. Oh, he must have gave you a show, huh? Wow. That guy. Who did he fight? He fought a British guy called Anthony Crowler, yeah. who's oh, yeah, actually, saw, who has won titles. You know, this yeah. guy's won titles. And he must have been out of his league. Huh? It was like, uh, several leagues. <laughs> he must have been out of his but league. But watching that guy, Lemonchenko. He's I, like a ballet pl- dancer. Yeah. He's a ballet dancer. He's extraordinary. Extraordinary. I thought one of the best I've ever seen. See, now I'm looking so forward. It's a young guy that we have from our community. What's he from Baltimore? And his name is Javante. Javante Davis. Javante yeah. Davis is his name. My son right? knows, yeah. Yeah, his name Javante <laughs> Davis. Yeah. And um, he's not ready for Machenko yet, but and let's say two years from now, I'd like to see those guys fighting. Yeah, because they're saying the problem he's got is he's so good, there's nobody really around to give him a legacy. You know, you fought all the big ones. You know, Ali fought all these great champions. Lemonchenko, there's no one as good as him. Yeah, so he, he, he can't have these big fights that everyone wants to see. What weight class is he? Well, he's going to have to keep fighting for many years then. Yeah. <laughs> hey, what is he? He's, he's light middleweight, is he? He's like a lightweight, 135 pounds. Yeah. He's a little guy, very master. But my God, he was impressive. It was. He doesn't breathe. It's, no, it's just simple. It's just easy. It's just like... Yeah. Um, it's like the toad. It's just like you're under that. It's just in the flow. Yeah, it's good stuff. Who's who's the greatest fighter you've seen? <sighs> man, listen, man. Anyway, just anyone. Because you're such a, an besides expert. Besides Ali, right? I'm talking about guys that I've fought with. Besides Ali, because Ali Ali's the best. But listen, man, um, Chavez was magnificent. Mm. For instance, let's talk about Chavez. You know, Floyd is making a big thing. I love Floyd. Floyd's the best. I, I disagreed with Floyd for so many years, but he he made me believe that he's the best, okay? We just think Floyd won 50 fights, he's undefeated. Imagine if Chavez stopped at 75. He was undefeated at 75. Imagine if he stopped at 75. No, forget that. Imagine if he stopped at 85. No, so I think he stopped at what? He got beat at what, 89, 90 fight? 90 fight, something like that. You know, Crazy. When you pass that record, then you, you know, that means that he's your weight. You're not Rocky Marciano weight. That heavyweight should be the 50 and no guy. They should break the record and all that stuff. You know, somebody should go after that record. Say, what, 89 and he was 89 and no. Somebody should go after that record. That is purely um, unmatchable. Okay? Yeah. It's just yeah. unmatchable. I, and I was living that period. It was just incredible to watch that, to watch that ride. Mm. Of him just winning fights after fights after fight, fighting every month, every two weeks, just fighting it all over the world, fighting, fighting, fighting. Do guys fight that much anymore? No, no. Yeah. You win a championship at 10 fights now. Yeah. Lemonchenko fought like 300 plus amateur, amateur fights, fights, right? Yeah. I mean, that's an amazing yeah. statistic. It's probably why he's so good. Yeah, yeah. But listen, he's... Willie Pep had 300 am- professional fights. I <laughs> like that. Really? Yeah, Willie Pep, look him up. Whoa. What a master he was. But for you, Ali would always be number one. Yeah, listen, um, you look at Ali, he was just magical. He he doesn't even look like a fighter. He looks more like a model than he looks like a fighter. You know what I mean? But when it comes down to fighting that into the right to the guts of thing, fighting with your guts at the last second, he's gonna outdog you at the end. He's an animal. He's just gonna fight you till you can't fight no more. He's an endurance fighter. Uh. You gotta be ready to fight fifteen rounds with him. He's not knocking him out in his prime. You gotta be prepared to go the distance. You gotta be endured. Even you gotta be ready to go 15 rounds before you even think about even beating. Them. I met him once at the Beverly Wilshire in LA. It was a hilarious night because I'd had dinner with Jerry Springer, who was the new host of America's Got Talent when I was a judge on it. Oh so we went out to, to get to know each other, right? And we had dinner at Mr. Charles, and we walked back afterwards. And during dinner, he said to me, "He said this show I do is it's the worst TV show in the world." He said, "It's the worst in the world." but it pays me so much money, I can't give it up. And he said, do you know who watches my show all the time? I saw him a few months ago. Muhammad Ali watches my show. Everybody watches Every day. Show. So, so I was like, I was thinking to myself, bullshit. There's no way Muhammad Ali told you he watches this show, right? This is bullshit. I'm thinking, now Jerry Springer, you're a bullshitter. I didn't say it, I was thinking it. So we get this, Mike. We walk back, ask Jerry the story. We walk back from the, hotel, uh, from the restaurant. We get to the Beverly Wilshire, which has the valet parking in the middle with the two wings, right? And we're both in the back wing, so we walk through valet parking. As we get to valet parking, a stretch limousine pulls up. It's Muhammad Ali and his wife 
get out of the stretch limousine. This is 20 minutes after he told me this story, right? So now I'm like, well, now we're going to find out, aren't we? And all I remember is two things. One, I remember the incredible reverence of all the staff at the hotel when they saw Muhammad Ali. Yeah. People were literally bowing to him. Some were in tears. It was amazing. Yeah, it, I've never seen this. Right, This guy could move people know, just crazy. by his existence. Crazy. And uh, the second thing I remember is they got out of the car and Muhammad Ali's wife said, Oh, Muhammad, it's Jerry Springer. Hey, Jerry, he's still watching the show. No, listen, <laughs> and listen. I went, oh, I, went, I don't believe it. Listen, Marty, what's the guy? Murray, Murray so Povich. Awesome. Yeah. Murray Povich. He, at first, he was a serious journalist mm. when he first started doing this show. And then he found out bullshit paid the bills yeah. when he started doing that pregnancy stuff. You are not the father. Oh my Man, God. the ratings went off the chart. Yeah, All yeah. the black people and Latino people started watching. It was fucking off the chart. Yeah. She you said, are not the father. Yeah. <laughs> when Muhammad came over. People loved that. That was like oh, the best man. game show he ever. A, he, got, he got a different career. He was a serious journalist, then he went to bullshit. That's the bullshit crazy. Was, yeah, Jerry was a man. You know, he yeah. was a yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, yeah. He was, he was a, and a news anchor. And he he had to resign as mayor because he he uh, slept with a prostitute and paid her by personal check. Holy Christ! They're like Jerry, how could you pay with a personal check? Uh, but great, he's a great guy, and I always believed everything he ever told me again. But Muhammad Ali got out of the car, and I just remember meeting him. I can remember every second of it, and he was pretty stooped by then and didn't really Man. speak very much. But he had this aura about him, yeah, which was extraordinary. And I said to him, "What do you like the Springer show?" He went. I like the fighting. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. It was fantastic. Oh, man. That's awesome. <laughs> oh, well, Pierce, what do you got man. going on right now, man? Well, I uh, obviously I got run out of the country, um, yeah. so I went back home for a bit. Uh, I'm, I'm hosting the morning show in Britain called Good Morning Britain. Awesome. So, I've been Britain. watching it on YouTube. Yeah. I mean, now we have fun. The lady yeah. That's with you. Who's the lady? That's with yeah, Susanna Reid. Yeah. 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 Um, we, have, we have good fun, and we're. Um, Ratings are going yeah. big, and we're having fun, and everyone's coming Look on. Like and you guys are having fun in the show. Yeah, we want to have Michael. I can't go. I can't do the show. He's, he's, I, on, he's on to stay up late right, enough, right? I can't do the show because I can't go to England. Yeah. We'll because work something. criminal record. We'll Maybe a something. Skype in. We could do something, yeah. We'll, do, we'll work something out. But I used to go all the time until after Mandela died, they said they made this law, this lady made this law, you served more than three years or so, you can't go to England now. I'm fucked. And can you not? Ah. There's no way you can appeal it? or. Um. Listen. Know who I was talking to? Tony Blair. Yeah. He was at my friend's house and they were having dinner and I happened to meet him there. And he said, This is ridiculous. I, it must be something I can do. Mm. And we're going to find out. It's just nothing. There we go. I feel good about it. It's you know? ridiculous. I feel good about think it. Think of the people we let in our country. Yeah. Please. I mean, no, look at the people that come from your country. Man. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, I'm going to campaign. We're going to get England, Mike Tyson right? back to Britain. In England, right? In different um, kind of. Um, Counties and stuff, they brag about who had the best killers and stuff and who mm -hmm. had the toughest guys in their neighborhood and their serial killers are tougher than your serial killers. Oh, they're, <laughs> they're tough. They're so, they're so um, testosterone orientated in England. Yeah. You know? We love a good fight in England and we love a good fighter. I mean, I mean, that's why Mike's so revered in England. They love him. Yeah. I was so crazy. One day I'm in England, I fight and I, I beat the promoter up. You know? I got mad. The promoter um, did something with my money. Uh, he was one of Don King's friends, and at the time, I was mad at Don. And I, and I'm just, I was just, I don't know what I was doing with my life back then. You were just pissed off, man. At what? I know. <laughs> I, know. I was making so much money. What was I mad about? I was, I just, I didn't like myself back then. I didn't think I was worthy of all that stuff. Had all these people, listen, people were diving in front of my cars, you know what I mean? Thousands of people. I'm like, what the fuck? You know what I mean? I'm just out of prison and stuff, right? I'm like, thousands. I mean, you, you can't believe this. The English people are just, uh, totally overwhelming. But then you, I, I saw on one of your podcasts, the, they were talking about your level of fame, and I was discussing it with my sons on the way here that we're trying to think of, there aren't many more famous people on this planet than Mike Tyson. Donald Trump would be one. You know, when he was alive, Nelson Mandela. Princess Diana when she was alive, but currently alive right now, you know, Muhammad Ali is sadly passed yes. as well. There are not many more famous people than you Mike on this planet. I mean, everybody knows who you are. If I say I'm doing this podcast. That's a like, trip. What does that make you feel like? That? I don't know. Um... <laughs> Great question, Pierce. 
I think about what I've what I've endured to uh, establish that. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of self degradation, mm-hmm. self hate, and stuff. And um, but why? But why you? Do you think, Mike? I mean, so many fighters. You know, some you know great fighters, but for some reason. You captivated the imagination of the world in a way that very few sportsmen, period, have done. Well, I studied the great fighters, and I studied, I periodically studied their lives and stuff. Even the great English fighters, Jimmy Wilde, and all those guys. And I, what I've learned about them is that they come from ex- extremely humble means, just extremely. And this is what always blew my mind: how they come from. You can't imagine the humble means they come from, and then. At the time of their life, next thing you know, they're, they're rubbing shoulders with queens and kings and emperors and people admiring them, and they come from they, the lives they had. And now you say, what the fuck? And those guys and those guys um, inspired me, and I wanted to be like them. And so I yes, I wanted to be the best I could. I wanted to meet everybody. I wanted to know everybody. I wanted everybody to know me. I wanted to perform in front of everybody. Did you ever meet Mandela? Yes. What was that like for you? He came to New York at the... Um, United Nations, when he came there, and the first thing he said, where does Mike Tyson live? After I beat Michael Spinks, the first thing he said, can I have his gloves? So I sent him the gloves. The ones he wore? Yeah, he was knocked wow. out. He was still locked up, though, but I sent him the gloves. Really? Yeah. Wow. To Robin Island? To, yes. Really? To his family. And then when you met him, what was that like for you? He's a very humble man. You know, God-like, you know, very um, zen-like type of guy. He was really awesome. Did he know about dope. boxing? Was he a boxer? He was a fighter. He used to be a professional fighter. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Fascinating. Have you met the Dalai Lama, Mike? No. I have. I would love you to have? meet the Dalai I, Lama. I asked the Dalai Lama a series of questions, right? Because he's the most cool guy when you meet him. But he loves <laughs> talking super about zen. sex. I don't know why, but he does. Interesting. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Probably because he's never had it, right? Right. So I, he's I said to the Dalai Lama, we're sitting there, I said, have you, have you ever had sex? He said, no, no. I said, what do you feel when you see a, a pretty woman? He said, I say, oh, they're a pretty woman. And then I say, remember, you are a monk. You are Dalai Lama. And then I have to cool down. <laughs> and then I went on. I said, I said, have you ever had a drink, alcoholic drink? No. Ever had a drug? No. I said, do you ever watch movies? He said, no. I said, well, not even a Richard Gere movie? He's going to be so pissed off when he hears this. He said, no. I said, do you watch television? No. I said, American Idol? This was the biggest thing on TV at the time. He said, no. I said, do you know who Simon Cowell is? What is that? <laughs> I said, very good question. And then we went through everything. And I said, do you, do you listen to music? No, not really. I said, what do you do? He said, I'm Dalai Lama. He said, I read. He reads everything. Incredibly intelligent man. He's outlived almost every other world leader apart from Queen Elizabeth II in Britain. He's met everybody had a very interesting take on American presidents. His favorite was George Bush Jr. Loved W, which very few people- I love that. And he loved, he got on very, so I just liked him, just got on with him. Uh, I've interviewed him a couple of times, but he's- he, That would be a conversation Dalai to Lama, see. You should get him on the podcast. He will talk about sex for as long as you want to talk about it. And I think it's because he's, he's just, he's the, never had what, it. What, what, why would he talk about sex if he know nothing of it? What because would he, he talk wants, about it I think of? he's just very curious, as what, you would what, be what, if you've what never What would he say it. about it? I, ask him. No, what did he say to you about it? What did you ask me? I said, how do you control, you know, you must, from the age You asked me, did you ever masturbate before? Well, I didn't get into the... No. thought that might be a Good question. I can leave that for you to ask him, but... Man, that would be serious. He's very, um, he has a kind of real serenity. I think he's 80 now. And and he's got a great sense of humor. I got him to do a selfie with my phone. He thought it was hilarious. He was like puckering up and stuff. I mean, he's a very intriguing character. Um, And yet he's the spiritual leader of, of so many people. Uh, I found him. I found you him very. Lovely. Reed, but what does he know about? Do you? Could you tell him if you said something like, "Do you know who Alexander the Great is? Do he know that?" I think history. He's good on. Yeah, yeah. probably know history that stuff. and current affairs. He'd be very up to speed on. He just doesn't waste time with what he calls right. trivial right. stuff. Right? Yeah, he doesn't bother with trivia. Movies. I don't think nothing in life is trivial. Everything has a purpose. Right, and this I purpose agree. You need to be discovered. It need to be searched. It's interesting. It's an interesting idea about that. You know, like how does a guy who hasn't really experienced anything understand? What does he know about love? It's interesting. Right. How did he speak um, right. the concept of love that all of us need to go to heaven? Mm-hmm. How did he concept that with spirituality? 
You know who else has never had a drink, cigarette, or drug? Donald Trump. Yeah. yeah. Well, he eats a lot had, of fast had food, though. Drink. He had an alcoholic uh, brother, brother called Fred. He was about 10 listen, years older. Let me tell you something, right? Nietzsche never had no pussy. In life. The first time Nietzsche had pussy, he caught the claps. All right? He never had died the first only time having pussy. That's bad. Who's this? Nietzsche. Frederick oh, Nietzsche. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. One time he fucked him when he got the clap first time. That's fucked up, man. That's some dark shit. He's a kind of dark guy. Yeah, he's a dark dude. He manifested that, maybe. Who do you most want to get on your podcast, Mike? Excuse me? Who do you most want to get? Who are your Cerebral guys, people more like this, the, the mystic types. This guy, Saad Guru? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dalai Lama Joan would be Collins, interesting. Joan Cannon, she was good. She mm. was good. Mm. How am I getting on? You're doing really awesome. You're the man. <laughs> You're doing really awesome. You're the man, dude. You are. It's, it's been great. You know, the, it's the, a very nice format. The, I like these podcasts. It's funny when I talk to people that are from like Europe, other parts of the world, England, or somewhere, like that, because um, they look at life from a deeper perspective than us. They're yeah. humans from another perspective. They have different humor than we have. Yeah, I think that's you know, so interesting. Like we're the kind of guys, like American guy like me, if I see a train hit a guy, I laugh. Holy shit, my thumb. You saw him get by a train. Like English people, people from Australia, what the fuck are you laughing at? Mm. You know, we all, we're just, um, I don't know, we're interesting people. We're all the same, but we're not. Mm. Yeah, there's like a, there's a depth, I think, and a richness in people from older civilizations yeah i think it's, you know? it's I, inevitable i think we have such less um patience than they do mm. the older countries mm. the older civilizations we're more impatient yeah well because you have less to, you have less to base it on historically you know you're in a rush america to be bigger better and everything else but you yeah. don't have any historical perspective where great countries have gone through lots of highs and lows so what do you think? You think you've been here before? Uh, in a previous life? Yeah. Uh, it's a good question. I find it, I think that our brains can't really compute the reality of life outside our own existence on this planet. Our brains are too small to really understand it. I mean, I was reading an astonishing thing on Twitter the other day. Some scientist put it up, astrologist, I think he was. And it was about the size of this planet compared to the rest of the galaxies out there. Ooh. And we're not just a pinprick. We're a pinprick of a pinprick. Right. You know, this planet is one of this and this solar system, and there are a gazillion solar systems, each, you know, massively different bigger. Different galaxies. Right. I mean, it's just, <laughs> different it's just insane. New black holes are discovered right. leading to different, you know I mean, dimensions. It was around the black hole picture that came out, and it, it, it just reminded me that we just have no idea out there. Now, I'm, I was raised a Catholic, right? So, you know, we, I have my religious beliefs from when I was a kid. Um, I'm not the most ardent Catholic you're ever going to meet, but certainly I was brought up that way. And I, got, I actually had spiritual guidance from nuns, Catholic nuns, which was very helpful when I was a kid, you know. Um, but I do think that we don't really, we, we can't comprehend life before or after this life we're in. And it'd be fascinating to know. Part of me thinks I may have been here before and part of me is pretty convinced that there's a life afterwards because i refuse to believe that we could be having this existence yeah this creation here and then that's just it i you know ricky gervais when i interview him is adamant that's just it and i will say to him but you're gonna be bummed when you're wrong dude right you know right when you're coming back yeah so i'm gonna have the I last laugh myself, how is this over how is this as if, as if i just turned off the switch and it's over mm. how does that work i don't i just can't believe it's that's not. what happens it doesn't make sense to me mike let me ask you a question what? if you take the idea of reincarnation with six billion and growing souls on the planet where's all this energy coming from if so many of us are recycled and we come back in another form over and over again. There are more and more souls coming in. Exactly. That's, how, that's why I have to look at my life. Newer with, souls. I look at my life not being concerned with my life. I have nothing to do. My life has nothing to do with me. Right. Everything I've done in life has nothing to do with me. It has to do with the creator. Yes. That source. Yes. You know, when I took another time when I took the toad, I, I felt all the pain of everybody that ever hurt. I felt all that pain. 
Interesting. You get yeah, released from a lot of pain from the, with the toad, Pierce. I threw up a it's lot, a Pierce, thing. too. I threw up a you lot. You did? Yeah, purge. I threw up a lot, purge, yeah. yeah. I've got to try this toad. It's magnificent. <laughs> I think it's time for me and the toad to uh, encounter each other. It's a good medicine. I did the toad uh, probably a year ago, right? I don't think exactly a year ago, but... Um, and I never and I and I, and I thought about that before, but I never I never thought this. I always thought about who am I, but I never thought why am I here? What is my purpose here? Mm-hmm. It can't be to knock out people for people to applaud to me and make me think that I'm somebody special. Mm-hmm. After taking the tour, I realized that I don't even exist. I don't even know if I exist at this moment. I just know I'm here. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. you look for those deep perspectives in yourself, and you realize that wow, it's almost over. I did all that stuff. I thought I did everything. I'm living my life. I'm 52 years old and I'm almost over. What am I doing now? What do I do now? How do I um? How do I make amends with myself? I don't know. It's very interesting. Very interesting. I I believe that we're just we are the physical manifestations of the universal mind. You know, consciousness is everything outside everything and then we just get this opportunity to be in these physical bodies to see what that experience is like well, i was say i said to ricky gervais i said what what was there before nothing atheists can never tell you right they're like well, what do you mean i said well what was there before nothing and if you can't answer the question you have to accept our brains aren't big enough to comprehend this stuff we can't comprehend that star right yeah All right you know what I mean? How do, why does it last so long? Why does it keep fucking um, getting brighter? And why can't we stop that? You're talking about yourself now, Mike. No. <laughs> never. <laughs> why can't we? You know? <laughs> we have no control. I was reading about the Rockefellers yesterday. Um, Dude, these guys keep coming up, Mike. And listen, right, they couldn't give their money away fast enough. They couldn't give it away. It was too much. It was crushing them. They couldn't give it away fast enough. Crazy. Have you read about any of the weird conspiracies about them and the Rothschilds? No, just that the Rothschilds financed every war since Napoleon. Hmm. You know, that kind of stuff. Listen, there was one um, particular story I, um, I saw with the Rothschilds. I was looking at this documentary, and um, there was other very wealthy Jewish families too that you know started like a hundred years ago and they, they got caught up in a concentration camp and they stole everything devastated their finances and stuff and the rough charge just managed to be lucky they, people stole a little bit of stuff but they just managed to go into other countries and just they just never lost they just kept um, accumulating wealth and so now this is the 30 this is during this is during the time of Hitler so it's going now it's it's now, it's now, like yesterday. And I'm looking, and um, they're still friends. They're still, families are still friends, but they're not wealthy. Mm. But they're still friends. You know what I mean? Germany devastated them, but they still know them. And, they, and, they just, and it continues to go on. Life continues to go on if you survive it. Mm. And that's what it's all about. Yeah. It's all about being grateful for your life. Right. And that was pretty, that's pretty interesting, I thought. Mm. Have you seen our show before you came on, Pierce? I watched um, <clears throat> two episodes yesterday. Oh, nice. Uh, Terry Crews and Mickey Rourke. Mickey, oh, those were good ones. I don't know Terry, but it's very good. And I, I know Mickey. And in fact, I did a big interview with him for British television just before The Wrestler came out. So he was still in that wilderness. Yeah. You know, he was like, he thought it may never come back. And then The Wrestler became his comeback movie. Yeah. And... Um, he was in his most raw and kind of Mickey Rourke, yeah, and the and wrestler. Once, and once the wrestler was a hit, he was sort of back in the old Mickey Rourke yeah. thing. But I got him when he was really quite vulnerable. He's really intense, though. Very intense. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's you know he's got in the ring. I mean, I admire anyone who gets in the ring. For sure, Listen, man. He is so crazy. Yeah. <laughs> Why would he go in there? And these guys are gonna kill him, man. Mm. He is so crazy. Mm. Uh, brave. He just loves it, man. Mm. He loves that. Mm. Well, it's been great having you, man. I love it. I've loved it. It's been brilliant. It's Thank been you very so much. awesome. It's been a real pleasure. You're great. Come Mike, back anytime. Mike, don't don't do this too often. You're too good at it. Oh, you put me out of a job. <laughs> no way. <laughs> All right, uh, everybody. Are we, are we out? Are we Another out? Another episode. Another episode of Hot Boxing. Thank you. 
awesome guest, awesome Piers Morgan. Guest. I'm Mike Tyson. I'm Evan Britton. And we're out of here. Hey, do you want anybody to know anything? Uh, uh, just watch Good Morning Britain if you if you Good can. Morning Britain. You get it, yeah. Good Morning Britain. Yeah. Am I watch supposed that. to? Um, what am I supposed to do with this, mate? Smoke it. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, man, Pimpy. Oh, man, oh. I mean, oh yeah. There he is. Come on. All right. Hey! Oh! 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 Oh!